We now get to the actual hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Aisha radiallahu anha says, and the hadith is in Bukhari, I don't remember any day except that my parents were Muslims. And I don't remember any day except that the Prophet Sallallahu would come visiting us in our house. Sometimes in the morning and in the evening. And then Aisha narrates that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was given the permission to migrate, and he told the Muslims to migrate, Abu Bakr prepared a camel to migrate to Medina. And he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for permission. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, wait, for I hope that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will give us permission. And so when Abu Bakr heard this, he asked, are you hoping for my companionship? Meaning, can I be with you? And so the Prophet Sallallahu said, yes, this is what I'm hoping for. So when Abu Bakr heard this, he prepared two camels instead of one. And he said, I did this for four months. We know that he emigrated on a Monday because Ibn Abbas as a Sahih Muslim that the Prophet Sallallahu reported that on Monday, Iqra was revealed to me. I became a prophet. And on Monday, I was born. And on Monday, I emigrated. According to our best estimates, the 26th of Safar, in the 13th year of the Da'wah, this would basically be the first year of the Hijrah. On that day, in the daytime, Aisha is narrating the same hadith, that when we were sitting in our house at the peak of the heat of the day, at noontime, it's a hot day, we saw a figure approaching and the streets were deserted. Nobody's there. And the figure had wrapped his turban around his head. Muqanna'an is, the, it's like the man who wraps the turban around his face, you cannot see him. Until we recognize from the distance that it is the Prophet And so we said, Wallahi, the only reason he must be coming is for something very grave to have occurred. This is an emergency. Nobody comes at this time. So the Prophet asked permission to come in. Abu Bakr granted it to him. And he said, remove everybody from the room. And Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, they are but your family. That's it. I.e. Aisha and her sister. That's all there was there. And of course, Aisha had already been engaged to the Prophet The nikah had been done. And so the Prophet said, Allah has given me permission to emigrate. Now Abu Bakr was waiting for permission to come to him as well. And so he asked him, O Messenger of Allah, did Allah allow me to be the companion? I beg you by my mother and father, did Allah give this permission? And the Prophet said, Now Aisha says that I saw Abu Bakr cry and I had never believed that people could cry out of happiness until I saw Abu Bakr cry out of happiness on that day. Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, I have prepared two camels. One of them is yours. And the Prophet said, only if I pay you the price of the camel till it becomes mine. And Asma, who is Aisha's older sister, Aisha's too young to do anything. So Asma had already prepared food and reserves for them. And so in the panic of the moment, she bundled up all of the food and she didn't have anything to tie the bag with. And so she took off her belt and tore it in half with her teeth and used half of a belt for her own garment and then used the other half for the bag of the Prophet and Abu Bakr and that is why she was called she of the two belts. And Abu Bakr had at this point in time 5,000 dirhams. So he took every last dirham that he had and he left nothing with Asma and Aisha. Why? Because he wants every penny for the Prophet And Ibn Abbas says Allah revealed in the Quran one ayah describing that night, the night of the Hijrah. And that is Surah Al-Anfal, verse 30. وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُ بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَخْرُجُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ when the people who disbelieved plotted secretly to either try to imprison you or to exile you or to kill you. And Allah Azza wa Jal plotted and they plotted. And Allah is the blessed best of those who plan. What happened that night? They came together in Darun Nadwa. Darun Nadwa was their parliament. And they came together in the middle of the night. There was a secret meeting. And representatives from all of the tribes of the Quraysh came except for the Banu Hashim. And so a Abu Lahab was not invited for this meeting. It's a matter of the customs of the time. How could Abu Lahab allow his own nephew to get killed knowingly? This would have been a shame for Abu Lahab as long as he lived. So he also was not invited. And they also left out another very important figure. And that is Mutim ibn Adi. Mutim ibn Adi is the one who's basically allowed the Prophet to remain in Mecca. It's his protection, not Abu Lahab's. And it is also said in a narration that has a slight missing link in it, that an old man came knocking on the door in the middle of the night. And when they opened the door, they saw a man they could not recognize who he was. They said, who are you? He said, I 
am a leader from the Najd and it has reached me that you're having a meeting and allow me to come. Perhaps I can benefit you with my wisdom about what you're planning to do. And Ibn Abbas says this was Shaytan. This was Shaytan who wanted to seal the plot, make sure that the actual plot that was done was that of assassination. When they came together, they began talking to one another and they said, the Muslims have now migrated to another land. And we are scared if we allow this man to leave, they will become a political threat to Mecca. The first suggestion, let's imprison him in a house. And this is what Allah is saying, Liyuth bituka. They want to tie you up. And the old man, basically Iblis, said, if you were to do this, his words would still reach his followers. Another said, let us send him into exile. Oh, yukhrijuka. Allah says in the Quran. Again, Iblis said, sending him into exile is to send him back to his followers. It will strengthen them rather than weaken them. And here is where Abu Jahl, of course, was in the audience. And Abu Jahl said, you still haven't said the point that is on everybody's mind, but they're scared to say it. Well, let me say it. Abu Jahl, why don't we kill him? But we'll do this in a way that nobody can get angry at any one tribe. Abu Jahl said, rather than one of us attack him, why not every single tribe sends one representative? And they fight him like one man, such that by the time he's dead, his blood is on all of their swords. So nobody knows who killed him, and all of the tribes are equally to blame. And he said, the Banu Hashim will have no choice but to accept the blood money. Otherwise, the Banu Hashim would have had to declare war. This was when Iblis stood up and said, this is the Ra'ya Sadid, this is the smart decision. And right then and there, every one of the tribe's people thought of one person in their tribe, the, a young, strong man, whom they could choose for this deed. And they sent them immediately to the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this was when Jibreel came down to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and informed him that you must make the Hijrah now. So this was on the same evening that he spoke to Abu Bakr and Ibn Ishaq reports without any Isnad that as they surrounded the house of the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet وسلم, went outside reciting Surah Yasin and they did not recognize him or they did not see him at all. We put barriers in front of them and behind them so we caused them to go blind or we covered them up and they couldn't see anything. He threw dust on their hair as a sign of humiliation as he walked out and they didn't even see this until after he had left. At the time he was still living in the house of Khadija of course because Khadija has passed away so he's living in the house and and with him is of course Ali because he's supposed to be taking care of Ali. Ali grew up in the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so he told Ali to stay in his bed so that if the Quraysh looked in, they would find somebody lying there. And it's dark, nobody sees who it is. They would assume that this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, had already prepared the two camels. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to the house of Abu Bakr in the middle of the night. The two of them in the middle of the night rode their camels and they went to, as we all know, the cave of Ghari Thawr. Medina is due north, straight line. Ghari Thawr is due south, exact opposite. And so they had already devised a plot to go to this cave and stay there for three days and three nights in utmost secrecy. They would then meet with a guide who would take them from a path that was unknown to the Quraysh. And in fact, they had to circle down to what is now Jeddah. And then they made their way to Medina from Jeddah. It is said that when the Prophet Sallallahu left Mecca, a Tirmidhi reports in his Sunan, when he passed the final shops of Mecca, in the middle of the night, he turned around to take one final look. And he said, speaking to Mecca generically or metaphorically, you are the most blessed land on earth and the most beloved to me. And were it not for the fact that my people have expelled me, I would never have left you. Ibn Kathir has over here that he also made a long dua and he has the dua recorded where he basically asks Allah for protection. He asks Allah to make the safa easy for him. He asks Allah for his mercy and his protection. Getting back to the story of Abu Bakr and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they had made an arrangement with three people to do three chores. The first was his son Abdullah, that every morning he would come out with some food and drink for the cave because they're not going to leave the cave at all. And he would listen to the people of Mecca what they're doing, which direction they're heading. In. So he would inform them on a daily basis in case they need to modify their plan. The second person, Aisha says, Amir ibn Fuhayr. He was Abu Bakr's freed servant. His job was to take out the flocks and make sure that the footsteps
footsteps of Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr are erased away. And then there was a third man assigned for the job, and that is Abdullah ibn Arqat or Urayqil. And his job was to lead them down this, what we now call Tariq al Hijrah. And Abdullah ibn Urayqil would meet them on the morning of the third night, and he would take them on this new road. In a narration that is muttafaq alayh, that's Bukhari and Muslim, Anas ibn Malik says that Abu Bakr narrated to us the details of the journey. Jabal Thawr was a very small chamber, and it is said that there was only space literally for two people in that Jabal. Now, Abu Bakr saw the Quraysh walking up and down the cave. Question arises, how did they get there? And this is not mentioned in this narration. It is mentioned in other books, Al-Baladuri and other books mentioned that when the Quraysh figured out that the Prophet had not gone the usual road, because all the other Muhajirun had taken the usual road, they hired an expert scout to figure out the traces of the camel from the house of Abu Bakr. And so he leads them to the base of Gharithur. And he goes, this is where I can trace it. From here, it's a mountain I can't follow anymore. So what happens? They all send in the troops and the forces, right? And so this is the famous incident that Abu Bakr looks out and he sees Abu Jahad and Umayyah ibn Khalaf and all of them. That's why they were on the mountain. And this is when he whispers to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that all they need to do is to look into this crevice and they will see us. If they just look down at their feet where they, we are now, they would see us because the entrance to the cave, it's at feet level. And this is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded to the famous phrase that all of you should know and memorize. Oh Abu Bakr, what do you think of two people? Allah is the third of them. So they crossed over the Ghar Thawr and they didn't realize they were in there. And there's a beautiful verse in Surah at tawbah which is one of the last surahs revealed at a time when the Muslims were at the peak of their power. After the conquest of Mecca, Allah Azza wa Jal says to the Sahaba, if you're not going to help the Prophet وسلم, don't worry, Allah has already helped him. When the Kufar expelled him from Mecca. Thani athnaini, and he was the second of only two people. Idhuma fil ghari. When they were in the cave. Idh yaqulu li sahibihi la tahzan. When he said to his companion, la tahzan. Inna Allah ma'ana. Don't worry. Allah subhanahu wa taala is with us. Fa'anzar Allahu sakinatahu alayh. At that point, Allah sent His sakina upon the Prophet sallam. Wa yadhu bi junud lam taroha. And He helped him with an army that you didn't see. A lot of scholars say this army is basically the dove and the pigeon and the spider. They are mentioned in some of the books. The story of the spider web is mentioned in Muslim Imam Ahmed, and there is a slight weakness in it. And so, out of all of the stories, this is the best story. As for the narration of the tree leaning down over the mouth, or the two pigeons setting up a nest, these are reported with massive missing links. So, third, fourth generation reporting what happened in the time of the Prophet. So, no problem narrating it, but we should know that this is not like 100% authentic. And so, after the third day, they met Abdullah ibn Arqat or Abdullah ibn Urayqil, and three of them began going on their way to Medina.